Welcome everyone. We'll be getting started in maybe another minute or so. But feel free to take a little time. Since the community we're part of. Make sure you have what you need to be able to sit comfortably for the meditation time. And as we wait another minute or so, it's a perfect time actually to be aware of the feeling tone. What's the feeling here? Can I be interested in the feeling and the quality of push? And you probably noticed that I've spotlighted myself so that if we do have Q and A, um, because we do upload these Zoom meetings to Common Ground's uh, YouTube channel, um, just to protect your privacy, I spotlight myself, but you can always click in the upper right and have gallery view if you wanna see folks. You don't have to be stuck just looking at me. So I'm going to go ahead and paste in the uh, chat, the three refuges. And let's go ahead and begin chanting the refuges as a way of coming together as a group, but also reminding ourselves of our practice, being awake to the way things are and letting our participation come out of that intimacy of Buddha knowing Dhamma. Sangang 
Saranam Gacham Me. And settle in upright, relaxed, relatively still posture for the meditation time. Perhaps you'd like to take a couple of longer, deeper breaths. And when you feel ready, just allow the breath to continue on its own. And just acknowledging the quality of feeling, feeling tone. It feels like this. And don't get tight about looking for a clear difference between the quality of the mind right now, the quality of the body as sensation or the quality of sound, sight, or any of the elements of the present moment. We just divide up or talk about the present moment as contact through one of the six sense gates, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touches, and mental activity, thought. So there's contact. Consciousness recognizes the contact. We call that perception. With the perception is a feeling, a feeling tone. <clears throat> you could call it a charge. And the feeling tone, for example, that's arising right now, hearing my voice or feeling your body sitting or whatever the predominant and conditioning experience you're aware of. The feeling tone is conditioning how this experience is for you right now. It's the moment's pleasantness or unpleasantness or neutrality affects us as we say. That's the push. So we're being affected right now by the feeling tone associated with whatever we're knowing, whatever's predominant in this moment. And if it's not clear what the feeling tone is, then we just presume it's neutral because neutral includes experiences that are neither obviously pleasant nor obviously unpleasant. And because of the conditioning force or push of feeling tone, it leads to emotional reactions. It leads, the feeling tone can lead to liking or not liking or all kinds of mental, emotional activity, mental, emotional reactivity or response to what's going on in the moment. So we say that feeling tone affects us, affects the heart and leads to some response or reactivity depending on how wisdom understands the feeling tone that's moving here, that's arising now. So 
So making peace as best you can with the experience of the sitting body. There's all kinds of contact. Hearing is being known. The different sensations in the body being known. Thoughts and any emotional reactions perhaps are being known, being felt. In all of this contact, all of this experiencing through these six sense gates, triggers or is the cause for a lot of feeling to arise and move. At times when there's more stability of present moment awareness, the movement, the coming and going of feeling tone can be quite ephemeral. Nothing really lasts that long because although the mind might be aware of a particular experience with a feeling tone associated with it. And the next moment it's aware of another experience with a perhaps completely different feeling tone. And as we settle more and more, you can use the breath, you can use the sensations of the whole body sitting. But at some point during the sit this evening, see if you can allow the experience of the heart itself to be the meditation object, the anchor for awareness, just the sensitivity of the heart, the feeling tender, exposed heart, heart that is exposed to all the feelings that are being felt. And you'll notice when there's a more stable, <clears throat> wise and forgiving presence, then there can be a lot of immunity, a lot of protection from reactivity. And in other times, <clears throat> There'll be less stability of awareness, less presence, and each feeling tone that touches the heart and notice some compulsion to act it out, to do something about it, to move the body if there's pain to try to fix a problem if there's a painful thought about something that happened today. So much of the activity of our life, thinking and doing, is our attempt to deal with the different feelings that have shown up. So when we notice that there's some reactivity, some thinking, some moving, some doing, 
and just ask like is there a feeling tone that's conditioning this activity triggering this activity that i'm observing And if you do notice there, there is a feeling, then just ask, well, can I just be with the feeling itself? The underlying feeling that's here now. And in a more or less fearless, curious way to be with the feeling. And when I am with the feeling, do I still need to react, still need to do something? And what is it like to be with the feeling heart? To be with the feeling tones that come and go without judgment. And you might even want to practice Sort of a healing practice where we give the heart permission to feel whatever it's going to be feeling. And wisdom is a good friend to this feeling hard and it says that I'm going to stay close. This wise awareness, I'm going to stay really close to this sensitive heart that just is constantly feeling what it's feeling one moment after the next. And I'm going to learn wisdom is going to learn how to stay close, how to be a good friend, how not to be afraid of whatever feelings touch the heart. Neutral feelings, unpleasant feelings, or even beautiful, pleasant feelings. Let's continue now in silence for a while. So keep it really simple this evening. We're just feeling the heart. And it's okay to coordinate with breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in, feeling the heart. What's the heart feeling? Breathing out, a willingness to feel the heart.
when I say heart, just being interested in what's here right in the center. So when we say we're feeling something, where is that feeling being now? Right here in the heart. So you can use your physical heart location as a beginning, but that's a little simplistic, but it can be useful initially. The heart, the mind that is sensitive, this is the object of awareness. So we can get quite skilled at noticing that the mind is lost in thought or caught up in some reactivity. And then in a sense, tracing back to the underlying feeling tone that's here, that's moving here, the heart. What's the feeling here? What's the feeling here and now? Can I be with the feeling? Relax. Not afraid to be exposed to the movement of feeling. We're developing this capacity to be with the feeling tone, to be interested in it no matter the particular quality or intensity of the feeling tone. And don't worry about naming it as pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. It's just what's being felt here 
in the heart. So we're just sitting here, experiences just roll on and on, sights, sounds, touches, thoughts, emotions. And every single experience, in a sense, touches the heart. And there's this affective push because of the particular experience that's being known. The heart is affected by this movement of feeling. And we're learning to be right here with the movements of feeling. And of course, we'll feel that push to want to make sense of the feeling, to want to come to some conclusion about what we're feeling or not feeling. But it is possible just to stay interested at the level of feeling, knowing that it's just this feeling being felt, being known.
So go ahead and adjust the posture as you need. If you came on a little bit late, I mentioned to everybody that because we uh, record the Buddhist studies and we put it up on Common Ground's YouTube channel, <clears throat> I've spotlighted myself and uh, that way your privacy, your screen, your video won't be on the YouTube recording. But if you wanna see everybody, you can just choose the gallery view, even though I'm spotlighting us for the recording or spotlighting myself for the recording. So remember that when we take up a study like we're doing these seven weeks, observing, learning how to observe the feeling tongue, you know, we deconstruct and we map out this activity of the mind because feeling tone is part of the activity of the mind, even though a lot of the feelings we feel have a visceral embodied quality, but not all feelings. Some feelings are really more just a mental activity that a lot of the feelings we feel can be felt in the body as well. Like if I see something really disgusting, it will be unpleasant as a mental experience, but my body, it's repulsion and seeing something really disgusting. I'll have a bodily reaction. So feeling show up in the body has tension a lot. But uh, the interesting thing that we can start, you know, we, we deconstruct it, but don't presume that like in your own subjective experience, there's gonna be a very clear thing over here that we call sense contact where I'm hearing a sound or seeing a sight or feeling a touch, thinking a thought. And then there will be perception and as a distinct event and then feeling tone as a third distinct event. And then mental formations or reactivity as a specific thing. Yeah, it's not, it's really not that clean. And especially with the contact, perception, feeling tone, it's just what we call having an experience or knowing an experience. And when I look at an experience, I can be interested in that momentary contact, a sight being seen, a sound being heard, a touch being felt, a thought being known, or I can highlight like the part of that moment of experience where the mind recognizes the experience, like puts a label on it, oh, I'm seeing this person or the affective feeling tone, that push. So one example you could use, uh, somebody sent a question in just before class, just asking me to clarify this and especially in terms of what we call emotions. That if I had a video camera that was simply recording the visual experience, right? but there would be no effective force in that video recording. It would still record the visual experience or I could have a microphone recording the hearing, you know, the sounds in the space, or I could have some other sensitive apparatus machine recording, you know, any number of phenomena, but there wouldn't be an effective force related to the sensitivity of the camera and the visual experience that it was recording. That happens when you have a human mind and body, right? Because that's how the past affects. This word affective is important. It's the affective aspect of the present moment. Because I'm having an experience through one of the six sense gates and I recognize it, then my past conditioning, my past relationship with previous similar experiences, it's going to inform this particular sense experience and it's going to arise as an affective feeling, a feeling tone that's affecting the mind and sometimes the body, not always, but sometimes the body, right? So. When you're, when we ask like, what's the feeling tone? What, you know, what does the Buddha mean by feeling tone? It's like, we're having experiences and we're being affected by the experience. How do I know I'm being affected right now by experience? Well, we look then, oh yeah, 
I'm, I'm feeling. And when we're not being effective, what do we call that? A neutral experience, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't affect us. We tend to ignore it. That's the big habit around neutrality. It's like, I'm not even going to give it the time of day because the flavor is, it's effect, the way it affects me is to ignore it. It's actually, in, you know, I'm being affected. Like there's some tension there. Like I'm conditioned, I'm being conditioned not to notice, not to be interested, right? But it doesn't seem like it's hard to notice the affect of neutrality. And the way we see it is like, you know, when we take up a meditation anchor, like being with the breath, which is, you know, a lot of the time pretty neutral. It's like how difficult it is just to be interested, just to track one in-breath, let alone one in-breath and then an out-breath and then another in-breath. It's hard because of the affect, the way we're affected by the neutrality of the, of the breath. It's like hard to keep it in mind. Seems like there's so many more juicy things for the knowing mind to be knowing. Like, like the thought, I'm bad at this. I'm bad at mindfulness of breathing. I'll know that <laughs> instead of just the sensations of breathing in, or I'm better than you are at this, or you know, any number of things the attention will go to. In one of the discourses, the Buddha says, be it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, one's own or others, one knows them as not worthy of grasping, deceitful, effervescent, seeing how they impinge again and again and disappear, one wins non-attachment from the feelings, free from suffering. So we're really learning not to be, like to be in this it's really a place of uh, empowerment to be aware that feeling the heart mind is being affected by sense contact all the time. And to keep that in mind, how, because I've been conditioned in the past, this mind stream, then when I'm triggered, when the heart mind is touched by experience, that past informs it to like, to not like, to ignore. And I wanna stay right at that place. And like I mentioned in the guided sit, if you catch yourself already entangled in worrying and planning and reacting in emotion, even really beautiful emotion, even really sublime emotion, doesn't matter, but to trace back, well, what's the feeling? So remember feeling is before does it require any concept? Because that's why um, Venerable Analio using the push, that word push is useful, even though we're mostly talking about a mental phenomenon, there is this sort of way the mind is being affected. And uh, Barbara wrote a question about, is feeling the same as feeling tone? I mean, we, in the Buddhist tradition, not everybody, but we often try to use a different word, you know, or phrase, feeling tone, because in English, we use feeling all kinds of ways, right? I'm feeling sad. But before that activity of being sad, let's say I'm crying, there's, there's a push. And like, if I'm already feeling sad and crying, and thinking about why I'm sad and crying some more, then a lot of that we'd call mental formations. So emotional, an, an emotional psychological response or an emotional psychological reaction to the sense experience, which is the specific contact and the way the mind recognized that contact and the effective feeling tone. So the reason you, I mean, it's okay. And I use feeling for feeling tone a lot, but we um, generally like in more technical ways, we'll use the phrase feeling tone 
when we're referring specifically to that effective push before the mind has gone down the road into a psychological emotional response to the experience and so but you know it happens obviously really quickly and so we're often when we catch it we're already beginning to have an emotional psychological response to the experience but that's okay because that's what's being known and then the, uh, the, uh, the practice movement then would be to be interested, well, what's the underlying feeling here that is related to the psychological emotional response or reaction? What's the feeling here? Can I get back? You know, of course it's changing, but in every moment there is a feeling tone to attune to. So we're really learning this more subtle aspect of the moment that we call the affective feeling tone because it's affecting the mind and the shape of the mind and how the mind is understanding and choosing to respond or react or close down or turn away or do backflips. But the mind, heart, body gets affected all the time by experience. And in a way, this is, you know, one definition of samsara, the cycles of suffering is that we're constantly pushed around by experience and in particular by the effective feeling tone of experience. We're in a way oppressed or even enslaved by the past because the feeling tone, the, uh, the way my heart's being affected, where else would that way of me being affected right now come from if not the past? And the way we liberate ourselves is we bring a lot of presence, a lot of wise presence, because we can't really stop the feeling tone from affecting the moment, but we can learn to understand how feeling tone is affecting the moment. So you may treat me in a way that triggers my conditioned habit to be defensive and to feel humiliated or something like that. But if i am been practicing, then the wise presence will feel that push of that unpleasantness. And because I can be with that push of unpleasantness, I don't have to, I could, but I don't have to go into the emotional psychological response or reaction to that humiliation. Like, to hit back with my words, you know, try to insult that person or to close down or to run away or, you know, whatever our habitual tendency is when I'm feeling that feeling that, you know, that unpleasant feeling probably. Now, another thing about, uh, oh, let me, I'll, I'll cover that a little later. <clears throat> So in this way, um, you know, the Buddha makes a big deal of learning how to be with this way the heart is being affected due to whatever experience is being known. And so, you know, because there are so many experiences being known in any moment, it's the more predominant experiences that we're interested in. So don't feel like you have to know every feeling tone, just like how could we know every sense contact or every perception? There's just so much happening moment by moment. But some aspects of the present moment are more affecting than other experiences in the present moment, right? And those are the experiences we care about. And so that's what we mean when we say like, well, what's predominant? And as you know, like we don't always work with a specific um, meditation anchor because it, although it can be very helpful like to do mindfulness of breathing and work with the sensations of breathing in and breathing out, but it's also nice to cultivate a more open attention so that we're getting good at noticing what's predominant. What is attention drawn to paying attention to? Because it's predominant, because it's affecting <laughs> Right? There's something about that sense experience and the perception of it 
that is causing this affection, right? The heart is affected by it. And there's a push into some sort of mental bodily activity, psychological, emotional, and bodily activity, right? And, and then we feel the push and we're training to be right at that push. So uh, these questions like emotions and moods and um, affects or uh, uh, reactions, they're just, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, you're not gonna find a clear line between like the feeling tone and the mood or the feeling tone and the attitude or the feeling tone and an emotional response because they're just, they lead to it. And remember, it isn't like there was one experience and that's all that's happening. And then with that experience is a feeling tone and then some kind of you know, movement toward a mood or an attitude or emotional response because there's just another experience and another feeling. So there's so much happening. We're just getting the general conditional or lawful nature of how the past through feeling tone is conditioning the present. And then if I act out the feeling tone based on habit, so if it's an unpleasant push and then the emotional psychological response is going to be conditioned by that unpleasantness what i say what i do right then i'm conditioning the future so i think i mentioned that last week the reason the buddha makes a big deal of being mindful being present with this more subtle aspect of our experience is it's where we learn about how the past is conditioning the present and how we respond to this feeling, how that conditions the future. So this is why it's such a potent place. And the sort of technical way we talk about it is, you know, we're a sensitive human being through these six senses. So because of that, there's contact, there's sense experience. Because of sense contact, there's feeling. Some of you will recognize this as the Buddhist map of dependent co-arising, which we study as one of the Buddhist studies courses. So we're sensitive in these six ways. We have sense contact, sense experience. There will be feeling, tone. And without a lot of wisdom in that moment, feeling tone leads to craving. So the push, basically the, uh, the habit energy gets identified with the push, gets attached. And then the push leads to action. So it goes from feeling to craving. That's the identification with the push to grasping. Grasping just means you're doing something about the craving, right? You can have craving, know you're craving something, but when you go to the fridge, then you're actually grasping, you're doing something. And then when you've gone to the fridge and you've gotten what you're gonna get and you've consumed it, then you've become the one who's acted on craving, you've grasped, that's, you've become somebody, right? So you have some karma, meaning all that means is whatever that left behind the feeling, the craving, the grasping, the going to the fridge and eating something, then the mind going forward has that imprint in it, right? So in a way we've dug the groove a little deeper, the habit a little deeper of, uh, this, whatever triggered that, a thought about the fridge and what's in it, you know, and then a feeling associated with that thought, like, oh, and then identification with that feeling tone, that's the craving, and then doing something about the craving, that's the getting up and going to the fridge and taking it out, putting it in our mouth and tasting it and delighting in it and swallowing and and then the becoming, the next step is like we become the person who has this karma, who has whatever the impression was, that impression lives on in the mind stream, whatever's left over from having done what, you know, the mind and body just did. So it's not judgmental in any way. It's just sort of like when we become, we become 
sort of the result, we, the results get integrated in whoever we are, whatever we are going forward. And the Buddha calls that the entire mass of suffering, <laughs> right? Because we're, we're basically reinforcing the habit of being led around, forced to act out feeling tone based on our conditioned habits, which is basically to go after what we like, what's pleasant, to run away and hide and hit back when it's unpleasant and to ignore neutrality. But obviously it's more complex than that, but that's the basic movement. And then the amazing thing is when we bring attention right to the level of feeling tone, there's some immunity when we can when we, there's enough stability of present moment awareness to really stay with that raw, immediate force in the heart. Let me just see here, a couple of questions came in. Um, yeah, is push the same thing as experiencing the feeling? Well, we can either be aware of the push or we cannot be aware of the push. And if we're not aware of the push, then the deep habit will be to identify. You know how it is. It's like when we feel that push of attraction, of liking, it really seems like there's a self who wants that. But when we, when, when in a way the mind is uh, st stabilized in present moment awareness, then that push is just seen as a natural phenomena being known. It's just another thing being known. But yes, the push is a way that effective force, these are words we use to point to what we're training the mind to be aware of. And then uh, another comment here, can feeling tone and the tendency to crave pleasant and avoid unpleasantness be thought as similar to, oh, I don't know, uh, paramecia movement or helotropism in plants. It does not even require a theory or consent of the mind or complex nervous system. Well, this is the, yeah, I mean, I don't know the, the specific um, biological experience there that you're pointing to, uh, but yeah, it's really interesting how uh, humans use, it's like a, it's an information system feeling tone. So it's not like a mistake, you know, it's not like evolution made this huge mistake and we have pleasant, unpleasant feeling tone and, you know, somehow evolution took a wrong turn and, and the result is we have a lot of suffering human beings. It's very efficient. And it's, as people are realizing, it's very related to the emotional system, which is a very sophisticated system to further survival, right? So there's a point to it. But as a spiritual person, right, by, in a way, the definition of being a spiritual human being is we see the sort of governing forces or the forces that govern survival. And because of the nature of our thinking, imagining minds, we can see like uh, what that is for this living thing to be totally into survival. And we can imagine, uh, even though there's a lot of conditioning towards survival, we can imagine, we can sense the limitations of just living this life to survive, you know, as long, as long as we can survive. And I think most human beings are at that place where it's not just about survival. And being spiritual then means we are asking the question, okay, there's nothing I can do about the way I'm conditioned except understanding with that wisdom, that stability of present moment awareness, understanding the forces that support survival as nature and not self. 
and that's different probably than other living things. I don't know, but presumably plants and more simple animals for sure have less of the capacity to, with their knowing mind, to reflect on the force of survival as nature. And then be, that gives, like I was saying with uh, feeling tone, it gives some immunity to just being driven by the conditioning, whether it's genetic conditioning or cultural conditioning. There's some freedom where, because the mind feels the push, feels the force of that conditioning. But because the um, feeling tone depends on like, um, it's not completely wired in as, and this is maybe your point, Charles Lee, that the feeling tone isn't wired in. So I can feel repulsed. I can feel something that's deeply unpleasant, but I don't have to do anything about it. Cause we have, it, we have this, and that makes a lot of sense because this is what makes humans <laughs> very good at, uh, you know, taking over the planet because this kind of emotional system we have and affective system that we have, it, it allows for a kind of complexity that more simple animals don't have. Because sometimes a really unpleasant feeling should go right to some strong reaction, but not always. And so I have this capacity to be with unpleasantness or to be with pleasantness without doing something, right? So if it's like we see somebody who has something I really want, but they're bigger than us or they have more power than me. So I'm not gonna take it from them, but I really want it. That's the push, the effective push is like, I want that thing. But I have this ability as a human being to realize I really want it. I really want it, but I'm not gonna take it. Doesn't make sense to take it. So what are my options where I could repress the desire to take it, the attached desire to take it, but then it's just gonna eventually explode, right? Because repression doesn't really work for long. Or if I, if I learn over time, I can be really aware of the push and then I find some freedom. Like if I can be intimate with the push, I realize that I don't need to gratify that desire to be free of it because it will go away on its own. The push goes away. This is the real discovery about the system of feeling tone. The unpleasant feeling tone, the neutral feeling tone, the pleasant feeling tone will go away without us having to get involved in some bodily, mental, emotional reaction to it. And once we learn that, it's like, there is a lot of liberation in realizing I can wait out any feeling time. And that really gives us power, like in, in just in terms of navigating our community life, where we, you know, because we live in community, we have to deal with a lot of feelings, feeling tones, a lot of desires, right? But we can't act on all of our desires when we're in community or anytime. So it gives us, and, and that can create a lot of like, if, all, if our only strategy is to act out our desires or to bury them, to repress them, we become an unhealthy person and we end up getting in trouble. But if we develop this capacity to be aware of feeling tone until it changes, we have a lot more capacity to navigate what it means to be a human being. John writes here, um, is it healthy strategic to try to take the backward step from craving to feeling tone, or should one simply try to be aware of craving? Yeah, but but if there's craving, we'll, we'll 
like part of what we mean by wisdom awareness, <clears throat> it's not just this penetrating depth into the sort of subtlety of the moment, but part of wise comprehension is a phrase in Buddhism. It really means like this breadth of present moment awareness. So we're really seeing cause and effect. We're comprehending how the moment is unfolding in a conditional or lawful way. And it's not conceptual. It's just reading in a sense, the conditional or lawful nature. So when we're intimate with craving, we'll see the feeling tone that's conditioning the craving. And if we're already in the action of grasping, doing something about the craving, we'll see the wanting, the craving, and we might even see the feeling tone and the experience. And when we're really good, we'll see where it leads to hell, <laughs> a hellish becoming. You know, We become somebody who's trapped in that uh, pursuing desire getting away from unpleasantness, going towards pleasantness. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to teach our dogs and cats not to act on the push. And this is what we observe in animals. You know, we, we observe this more robotic, when there's pleasantness, there's really not much choice, but to do something to gratify it. When there's unpleasantness, there's really not much choice, but to try to get away from it. But, you know, dogs, it's interesting with uh, mammals at least, and I think probably other animals that like when it's really unpleasant, if there's something they can do about it, they'll do it. But if there's nothing they can do about it, they don't worry about not having anything to do about it. It doesn't seem, I mean, we don't really know. Um, but uh, humans, you know, we can, because of our system, our idea, our sort of psychological system, our ideas are very powerful. It's a very powerful conditioning thing because even though the experience of um, somebody mentioning ice cream, you know, going back to the whole, the situation I described earlier, I see an ad on TV for ice cream. I, I realized there's ice cream in the freezer. So that thought, that image on the TV screen, and then the thought, there's a pleasant feeling with the thought of having it. Right? So there's, that's that effective push. And then if I misunderstand that effective push as me, then all of a sudden there's a me who's not happy, but will be happy if I have it. But that required that moment of craving where a good definition for craving is to take desire personally. So desires, like when I realize there's ice cream in the freezer, then it's okay that there's desire. The problem is if I'm convinced, arrogantly sure there's a me who will be uh, meaningfully happier if I have it. Right, so then, then there's this, uh, that's, that's the grip of craving because now the desire is in a sense owned by the, the perception, by the construction of a self, me. And so now I'm gonna do something about it and on and on. So another question we can ask in this investigation is, um, you know, you hear the Buddha saying, yeah, be mindful of feeling tone, but if you don't want to, if you don't want to buy it, that's fine. Just ask the question, when I, when I pay attention to what does the grip of attachment weaken and fall away? What do I need to pay attention to that causes attachment, the grip of attachment and grasping to go away. And what, when I pay attention to what, does it get more intense and the suffering 
that goes with that get more intense. So it's a really pragmatic question. We come to the relevance of being aware of feeling tone because it works, not because it's dogma. It's dogma because it works. So if we don't want to take the Buddhas, like what the Buddha discovered, we could just deal with it pragmatically. Okay. So like if I keep paying attention to the thought that there's ice cream in the freezer and the thought of what that would taste like and take that push of the pleasantness personally so it becomes craving, then what does that set in motion? Well, it sets in motion somebody who's tight because I can't be happy now because I imagine how happy I'll be if I have it. So that means right now I'm unhappy. Like if I really think I'm going to be happy having the ice cream, then I can't be happy now. I've just made myself unhappy by making, by identifying with the idea that if I have it, I'll be happy. How can I be happy now if I need that to be happy? So this, we create the suffering. Attachment creates suffering. The suffering of discontentment, you could call it. This is from <clears throat> Venerable Analio's book um, that I mentioned. Uh, it's really a great text on the Satipatthana. He writes um, in the chapter on feeling tone, the antidote to the activation of the underlying tendencies towards desire or craving, aversion, and ignorance is mindful observation of the nature of the feeling that has arisen. Developing mindfulness in this way has the intriguing potential to enable one to become aware of the reaction to any feeling, even before this reaction is fully started. Here, a special effort is required to remain mindful of feelings, even when the mind has been carried off by sensual fantasies, thoughts of aversion or vain imaginings. So this is what he's saying, like we might be really in the storm, but even in the storm, and that storm has some momentum, so it may not just cease because we know we're in a storm, right? We really want something, we're caught up, but we just do the work of, as best we can, keep turning the attention to the feeling tone. Feelings that arise at such times are obviously worldly types of feeling. And contemplating them with awareness is the very means for breaking through their conditioning impact on the mind. The way we break the chain of samsara, the endless spinning, where the past is conditioning the present and then acting out the feeling tones conditions the future. The way we break it, it was, is we stay aware of the feeling tone as best we can. We keep it in mind. This is from uh, another version of just saying how it works, especially when we already have gotten caught. This is from um, a book that Joseph Goldstein and Jack Hornfield wrote a long time ago, Seeking the Heart of Wisdom. And this particular chapter um, was written by Joseph Goldstein. And they write, awareness of feeling in this way, like being aware of feeling with balance and equanimity provides a key for unhooking the mind once it has already been caught in a reactive state. Suppose the mind is lost in a lustful state with strong and delightful images enticing the attention. In addition to noticing the bodily sensations and images that are present, if we can clearly and precisely notice the pleasantness of these sensations or pictures, then we can see very different, very directly, that it is the feeling of pleasantness which is capturing the mind and the conditioning of grasping. So this is really important. It's not the experience. It's not like going back to the example. It's not me seeing the ad for ice cream. It isn't even the thought, oh, there's ice cream in my freezer. Those aren't essentially a problem. The problem is 
the feeling tone and the mistaking the feeling tone, thinking that it's my feeling as opposed to it's a feeling being known. It's a feeling tone being known. That's the problem. It's the misunderstanding of the feeling tone that creates all the uh, agitation and the, the you know, grip of all of our unwholesome reactivity. It's the misunderstanding of feeling tone. And just a couple more sentences here. By meticulously noticing and noting this aspect of pleasantness, the mind unhooks from the object, lets go of the grasping, mm -hmm. and is aware of the pleasant feeling simply as another object of observation, rather than as something to hold on to. When we understand how desire or craving is conditioned by feeling, we see that, the, that underneath the wanting mind is a place of choice. In situations where we find ourselves caught in a reaction of strong clinging or aversion, this second foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of feeling tone, can be a powerful tool of investigation and freedom. So this next week, you know, we'll be especially interested in unpleasant experience and uh, you know, start with experiences that aren't overwhelmingly unpleasant. I mean, with those experiences, if you have them that are overwhelmingly unpleasant, you just do the best you can. But get especially interested in really workable, unpleasant mental experiences, like a painful memory, painful sight, a painful touch, a painful sound, and get curious about identifying with the push like it's kind of like sensing an arrogant certainty that i have a problem and that idea that i have a problem there's no space in the mind it's like no no that's actually what's going on here i have a problem i'm cold i'm hot i'm hungry i'm this i'm that and if we can just back to there's an experience being known it feels like this can I stay here? Can the awareness and wisdom be here? And then you can even experiment like turning your attention to other phenomena. Because like one of the examples the Buddha uses is, you know, when you rub two sticks together, I forget exactly how that works, but I guess there's different ways, you know, where you spin a stick, but to start a fire. But the fire depends on the contact you know, the, the friction of the two things. So the arising of the feeling depends on that particular hearing that sound, seeing that sight, thinking that thought, having that memory. So one of the ways to break, like if you don't have enough wisdom to see that the feeling is nature and not self, just to be aware of the feeling tone, without, because of habit, personalizing it into craving where we get identified with the push. And so the desire becomes craving and there's a grip. Then practice, well, you can just ask yourself, well, what else can I pay attention to in this moment? Why do I keep paying attention to this sound or this sight? You know, like you're trying to sleep at night Maybe you have some thunder. I hear it in the background right now. Use those of you in the Western suburbs of Minneapolis probably have the storm. But anyway, let's say you're trying to sleep and there's a disturbing buzz of a street light or somebody's loud motorcycle or something like that. And it's like the awareness goes to the sound and then the sound triggers the painful feeling tone and the painful feeling tone triggers the emotional and psychological reaction. What the hell is somebody doing riding their motorcycle at one in the morning? Don't they have any compassion for those of us who have to get up and work and on and on like that. And then of course, those thoughts will be the next predominant experience. They will be painful thoughts probably. That pain 
will trigger the next emotional and psychological reaction and on and on it goes. So instead of the mind or the attention continually looking at an object that is unpleasant, you can ask yourself, well, what else can I pay attention to in this moment? Maybe I won't pay attention to sound. Or maybe I'll pay attention to this other sound. You know, I'll turn my fan on and I'll hear the sound of the fan. Or I'll turn some background music on. Or I'll pay attention to some my breathing. Or I'll do loving kindness practice and pay attention to that. So sometimes we don't have enough stability and wisdom to see that feeling tone is nature and not self, that I can be intimate with the feeling tone without identifying with it, identifying with the push from craving to grasping to becoming. I could just be with the feeling, but if we can't, then be aware of something else that has a different feeling tone. And you know we're caught when we wanna keep going and you know, when we're really irritated and angry because of something difficult that's happened, even if we turn away from that, we tend to look for something else that will make us angry. Have you noticed? Because we're really in the rut. We really are identified with the emotional reaction to unpleasantness. So we'll look for more unpleasantness to feed the emotional reactivity. So that's where we can really, like if we have a good friend, they'll help us change the channel, won't they? Hey, let's go for a walk. Let's do this, let's do that. So that we can absorb and be aware of other experience that will break that aversive cycle or that greed cycle or whatever cycle we might be caught in. So I'm gonna, I want to cover a few of the questions that have come in the last couple of weeks. This came in a couple of weeks ago. Um, this person writes, it was helpful to be given the prompt to pay attention to how we believe pleasant experience will become our savior. Some of you might remember, I think it was at least two weeks ago, I mentioned that's part of that promise that's never kept around pleasant experience. This past week, I've been noticing a lot of underlying stress and anxiety in my body, heart, and mind. And the result has been to ramp up my spiritual practices. Doing more sits, yoga, qigong, walks by the river, etc. However, I'm now noticing that my relationship to these practices over the past week has been an attitude that they will save me from my stress a sense of craving has slipped in around my practi around practice itself. I think I'll just have to get through the next two hours of this unpleasantness, and then I can do a guided sit. It's like I've been, uh, I've implemented a reward system for myself with spiritual practice as the prize. Yeah, and it's so cool that this person is noticing that. And the interesting phenomena that we that sinks in over time is anything I have to run from becomes more of a monster. Anything I have to control, anything I have to fix, the idea that this is not okay makes it not okay. Now, there are some things that will kill us, <laughs> you know, but if there's something we can do, we do it. If there's nothing we can do, or if in doing something, there's nothing we can do that doesn't, that the doing of it turns out to be more stressful than just being with the feeling tone. I don't know if you remember the quote I read from Sylvia Borstein a few weeks ago. I won't be able to paraphrase it very well, but it's something like that discovery that the desire to fix, the desire to get rid of, turns out to be more painful than just being with the initial painful feeling or the, the feeling tone, whatever it might be. And this person writes, ironically and perhaps predictably, this has only ramped up my anxiety. 
because the mind is focusing on relief from pain while knowing the relief is ephemeral, right? This is great wisdom. This is how the mind grows up and has deep spiritual insight. It sees this thousands of times, this cycle. It feels like I'm reading again. It feels like I'm, I can get temporary relief on the cushion or on the yoga mat, but then it's over. I've become a spiritual junkie just waiting for my next hit. Now, it's still okay. Like we do this all the time. I'm feeling a little anxious. I'll go have some chocolate. I'll go take a nap. I was a little anxious a little earlier. I took a bath, you know, a nice hot bath, put my bubbly in it. It's my special bath bubbles with just the right scent. I generally don't like scents, but more natural scents I kind of like. And uh, so it's okay to use pleasantness to modify the unpleasantness of anxiety or whatever the, the unpleasantness we're modifying. What we don't want to do is tell ourselves a lie because the bath works until it doesn't work. It doesn't really, it doesn't really uproot the tendency for me to get anxious. It just is it, you know, we can use pleasantness as a way of shifting channels. Like I mentioned before, like taking a walk or hanging out with a friend can be a way to break the cycle. But eventually we have to learn to, because there's going to be some unpleasantness or pleasantness or experience that we're not going to be able to avoid. And we're going to want to be able to be with the pleasantness without grasping, you know, be around an attractive person, somebody who for us is very attractive, but I'm in a committed relationship. Well, I want to be able to be around a really, 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 really attractive person without getting out of balance, right? Without having to act on the attractiveness. Now I can't make myself not attractive to people that I'm attracted to because that conditioning is already there. But I can understand the push as just a impersonal push. And that gives me a lot of freedom. It's same thing with like, I don't have to steal things I like because I can feel what it feels like to like that thing and not have it. I know how to feel that feeling. I can get really angry at somebody without having to hit them. Cause I know what it feels like. I know how to be with that feeling of anger, the unpleasantness of it without acting it out by hitting somebody. Or sometimes, you know, maybe would be to run away or to hide. So it just gives us like uh, the other quote I, I read all these other choices. And we don't always want, you know, it's really, useful to have a few tricks up our sleeve to be able to do qigong or to do a deep relaxation or to listen to guided meditation like this person is talking about these are obviously pretty skillful ways to change the channel but you can give yourself permission to use these things but maybe start weaving in <clears throat> like you say to yourself if you need to listen to a, a guided meditation fine. If you need to take a walk, fine. If you need to do some yoga, fine. But before, just sit and ask yourself to feel what you're feeling. And maybe lie down, like bring in a little comfort, and then really turn to the unpleasantness of the anxiety. Can I feel the push of this anxiety? The push that leads me leads to this sense of a me who wants to get rid of it, a me who needs to, to, you know, turn away from it. And it's like we, we play as long as it can still be play. As soon as it's not play, it's probably good to change the channel. But as long as there's some lightness, there's some space in the mind, some real interest, then like 
practice dying to it. Like, let, well, let's just see, maybe it will kill me. I mean, I'm saying that as a joke, right? But it, cause that's sort of the story in the mind. Like if I feel this anxiety, I'm gonna suffocate. I won't be able to breathe. It's gonna trap me. Well, that's, so when there's still enough curiosity, enough space of wisdom, then check it out. And then when it doesn't feel safe to check it out, then use one of those other techniques. So then we're really developing our bandwidth to be with some of this strong, uh, you know, sometimes the most painful thing isn't real obvious. It's, it can be subtle, wormy unpleasantness and anxiety sometimes is like that. Fear can sometimes be like that. It's not always this big, obvious, you know, pain. It can be kind of a destabilizing worminess uh, that's both visceral and mental, emotional. It has sort of elements of both body and mind. And that's our homework for this next week. And then the last week we'll go into looking at neutrality, but especially for this next week, and I, I sent some really good articles including one by Tanisara um, about just being with Dukkha. And we'll pick it up next week and have small groups. Hopefully you'll arrange your schedule so you can stay for the small groups. It's really an important part of the Buddhist studies program to lean in, especially if you're shy with these small groups, um, to just do your best to show up and share what you've been learning and to hear what other people have been learning and, and benefit from that. Thanks for the great questions. I have several more that people have sent in. I'll try to get to them next um, Monday evening. Wishing everybody a good week and a lot of safety out there. And hope to see you next Monday, Monday evening.